All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're glad to have our first paper session of the morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, so my name is Ed Notek. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and this is the Empirical Models paper session. We're going to have two great papers today. The first one is going to be Inflation at Risk, presented by Francesca Luria from the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Our second presenter will be Paolo Bonomolo from the Netherlands Central Bank, presenting Long Run Phillips Curve is a Curve, the Long Run Output Gap Inflation and Monetary Policy. So as we've done before, and just as a reminder, or um, in case you weren't here yesterday, um, so please put all of your questions into the chat. Uh, we will accumulate them, and at the end of our two papers, we'll have some time for Q&A, um, or authors can potentially um, answer those questions at their leisure um, during the session. But uh, we'll try and keep some of those for the end for Q&A to have a, a lively discussion. Um, so with that, Francesca, uh, the floor is yours. I can see you, and I see your slides, so you are all set. Take it away, please. And you can also hear me, right? I can. You're good to go. Perfect. So you have 20 to 22 right. minutes. Thank you. Uh, so let me start by saying that I'm particularly indebted to both organizing institutions uh, of this conference. The ECB's uh, Price and Cost Division hosted me for a PhD traineeship during my graduate studies. and. Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland invites me for a job market talk uh, back when I still had no gray hair. And I really enjoyed the conference so far and really very much appreciate the opportunity to present my work among so many important contributions to the literature. Finally, thank you all for attending this session. So today I'm going to present some joint work with David Lopez Salido, which studies inflation at risk and the usual disclaimer applies. Now, the first question that some of you might ask is why we should care at all about risks to the inflation outlook. Well, since the upheavals of the global financial crisis, the emergence of downside inflation risks have increasingly become a source of macroeconomic concern. And as already extensively discussed at this conference, uncertainty surrounding inflation has widened considerably across the globe since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in fact, risks have shifted from persistently on the downside over the last decade or so to decidedly on the upside in the face of resurging demand and supply shortages as, a, as economies reopen. Now, in the presence of these uh, tail risks, and as President Draghi's quote on this slide reminds us of, the conditional inflation mean may not necessarily portray a complete picture of the overall inflation outlook. So the starting point of our paper was precisely the desire to extend our understanding of these risks. After all, uh, most of the analysis studied the muted response of the conditional mean of inflation, leaving fairly unexplored what happens to other parts of the inflation distribution. And with the literature, pointing to quivering Phillips curve linkages, our question was whether there are some macroeconomic factors in the Phillips curve umbrella that are still at work, perhaps in the tails of the inflation distribution. To be clear, by inflation distribution, I mean the predictive distribution of inflation over the next year. So such a distribution can answer questions like, what is the probability that inflation will be above or below, say, 2% over the next year? So to answer these questions, in the paper, we estimate a quantel Phillips curve, a fairly well understood and microfounded time series framework that allows us to study the risk to the entire distribution of the inflation outlook coming from both conventional inflation determinants as well as financial conditions. And what we find is that the recent muted response of the conditional mean of inflation to economic condition does not necessarily convey an adequate representation of inflation dynamics. Indeed, we find ample variability in the tail risk to inflation, even when we focus on the post-2000 period of stable and low mean inflation. <clears throat> 
In particular, we find that financial conditions carry substantial and persistent downside risk to inflation. And our findings are consistent with evidence from a nonlinear DSGE model, survey data, inflation options, and the regime switching model of inflation. Some of these results I will present today. So we see our paper as ultimately offering a new empirical perspective to existing macro models and to policymakers by highlighting the presence of a significant relationship between credit conditions and risks to the financial, sorry, to the inflation outlook. Okay. Our result that there have been sizable downside risks to the inflation outlook in the last 20 years, mainly accounted for by financial tightenings, is consistent with the idea that due to amplification mechanisms, when financial conditions become tighter, firms cut prices disproportionately more on average. And these concepts are related to recent research, some of which cited here, which shows that financial conditions matter also for inflation dynamics. Now, while these studies focus on the model outlook, we extend their insights to the study of the inflation tails. And in fact, implications for the tails of the inflation distribution and the role of financial conditions have been fairly unexplored by the literature in general, although there have been some efforts. And in particular, the last two studies, uh, some of which featuring uh, ECB authors, take our framework as a starting point and confirm our findings that financial conditions are indeed important determinants of inflation risks and especially of downside risks. Okay, so we now move to characterize these inflation risks. We model the conditional quantiles of average future inflation over the next four quarters as relating linearly to inflation determinants XT across quantiles tau. Notice that the determinant XT can exert nonlinear effects on inflation dynamics if it affects differently the median than the tails. Given data for the right-hand side variables, inflation quantiles can be constructed for each point in time t, even beyond the estimation sample, as long as data for xt is available. To obtain the inflation densities, we then fit a flexible skewed t distribution by Azzalini and Capitano on the estimated quantiles, very much like in the paper by Adrian Boyarchenko and Giannone. One last thing I would like to bring your attention to is the fact that running a regression of this type is akin to a direct forecast as opposed to an iterated forecast where the dependent variable would be pi t plus one and where one would iterate the one step ahead prediction to obtain multi-horizon uh, forecasts. Now, as discussed in uh, my paper with uh, Dario Caldara, Danilo Cascaldi Garcia, and Pablo Cuba Borda on Markov switching models and growth at risk, in simulation, direct and iterated forecasts delivered the same results when they share the same VAR data generating process. In empirical data, both the direct and iterated model perform well in terms of predictive scores and most importantly, perhaps in the context of density forecasts in terms of coverage and correct calibration of the predictive density. All right, so to give you a glimpse into our augmented quantile Phillips curve model, I list here the variables conditional on which we are estimating the quantiles of average four quarter ahead for CPI inflation in the United States. The first set of conditioning variables directly relates to inflation. Okay, so these are average inflation over the previous four quarters and long-term inflation expectations from consensus economics. To preserve the notion that inflation persistently deviates from inflation expectations, we impose the homogeneity constraint in prices by constraining the two coefficients on these inflation determinants to sum up to one. We also condition on measures of labor market slack through the unemployment gap, of relative prices through import or oil prices, and of financial conditions through the gilchrist zakrashek credit spread. So in the paper, we look at how the importance of risk factors changed across time. And indeed, two distinct subsamples emerge when characterizing the determinants of the inflation distribution in the United States. Uh, 
The first period running from 1973 to 1999 notably covers the OPEC shocks, the subsequent Volcker disinflation and the early stages of the Great Moderation, whereas the second subsample running roughly from 2000 onwards is characterized by large movements in credit spreads, progressively well anchored inflation expectations, but subdued inflation pressures. Now, in the figure presented here, you can see the estimated quantile slopes for each inflation determinant for our two subsample. So each box stands for an inflation determinant, and the blue, red, and yellow bars are respectively for the 10th, 50th, and 19th quantile regression coefficient. Now, as you can appreciate in the middle right box, over time, long-run inflation expectations, which we here treat as exogenous, became the decisive inflation determinant. And this is consistent with the analysis, for instance, in Blanchard, Summers, and Cerruti of a time-varying parameter version of the Phillips curve model. Now, I want to pause here for a second to recognize the fact that um, to an applied econometrician like me, it did not appear all that surprising that in the last subsample, when regressing a relatively constant variable, that of average future inflation, on another relatively constant variable, that of inflation expectations, one would find a strong relationship between the two. Well, it turns out that if you decompose inflation into a cycle and the trend component, for instance, say using the Elmar Mertens uh, 2016 restart model, inflation expectations became more important over time in terms of forecasting precisely for their predictive content of the more slow moving trend component of inflation. Now, one important point that uh, we also make in the paper is that it would, however, be misleading to dismiss the, roles, the role of other factors. In fact, credit conditions, the box at the bottom, and to a lesser extent, labor market, market outcomes, the upper left box, are key drivers of the asymmetry in the inflation distribution in this more modern quantile Phillips curve for the last subsample, while inflation expectations only have a symmetric effect. Now, focusing on the credit spread, you can see that there is a substantial subsample instability in its link to the inflation outlook. The first sub period is characterized by relatively small variations in credit spreads in a period of high and volatile inflation reason why the actual contribution of credit spreads to the inflation outlook in that period is smaller. And from 2000 onward, low and stable inflation has coexisted with substantial variation in credit spreads, especially, as we know, during the global financial crisis. Now, focusing on this most recent subsample, a novel result is that the link between the inflation outlook and financial conditions is asymmetric in that an increase in credit spreads is associated with a larger increase of downside risk than in a reduction of upside risks. And this is reminiscent of the results for the GDP growth outlook in Adrian Boyarchenko and Giannone and confirmed by other papers that they previously cited. Notice that all coefficients are statistically significant and that ANOVA tests on the equality of the slope coefficients across quantiles reject the null hypothesis of equality between the slopes on the 10th and the 50th quantile. I now want to provide some theoretical grounding for our results. So in general, our findings can be rationalized by nonlinear models featuring amplification mechanisms such uh, that the relationship between credit spreads and inflation is more pronounced during bad times. Our findings can, for instance, be replicated by applying our quantum regression framework to simulated data generated from the Gertler, Kiyotaki, and Prestipino model. Their model, just as a reminder, is a fully microfounded nonlinear DSGE model, which features the possibility of a severe financial crisis through a bank run. And there are two equilibria in their model, one with and one without a financial panic. So when shocks are small, the economy fluctuates around the standard equilibrium. In contrast, a big negative shock pushes the economy into a bank run equilibrium. Now combined with a sunspot shock, it triggers a financial panic and bank net worth collapses. Banks are forced to sell assets, which ultimately disrupts firms borrowing. Consequently, economic activity drops substantially more than in the equilibrium without a bank run. 
So we simulate the model using the original calibration of the D parameters and of the capital quality shock process. And in order to generate a rare financial crisis, we calibrate the process for the sunspot shock such that the bank equilibrium arises after big negative shocks of above two standard deviations. We simulate this model a thousand times and store the inflation rate, the credit spread, and the capital quality shock. We then run a quanta regression of current inflation on the credit spread. Okay. And uh, the chart here shows the quanta regression slopes estimated on simulated data from that model as I just described. So the negative slope coefficient for the 10th quantile echoes our empirical findings that higher credit spreads are associated with an increase in downside risk to inflation. Now, in terms of identification, what delivers this result is that during bad times, those featuring a bank run, the conventional channel whereby lower demand results in subdued price pressures is strongest. But the reason why the 90th quantile indicates a positive relationship is that in good times, without the bank run, a capital quality shock reduces capital and thus results in an increase in the rental rate of capital and thus in marginal costs. Now, the mean and quantile captures the tension between these two effects, and indeed, it is around zero as in normal times, these two effects almost offset each other. Okay, so to test whether this relationship also holds in financial markets, we run an OLS regression of options implied inflation probabilities of one year ahead CPI inflation on the credit spread. And in the left panel of the figure, we present the estimated coefficients of that regression. On the right, we report the estimated quanta regression slopes for US core CPI over the last subsample that you just saw uh, previously. Now, the slopes on the left are rescaled so as to facilitate the comparison with those coming from our quantile Phillips curve model. And you can see that despite the vast disparities in the construction of the tails of the inflation distribution, the estimated slopes are very similar to each other. Most importantly, as the inflation probability cutoffs increase, their relationship with credit spreads weakens. And this again is reminiscent of our key result from the estimated quantile Phillips curve model over the last 20 years of data that we have here on the right. Okay, so we also analyze how a nonlinear model such as a regime switching regression compares to our quanta regression estimates. We move to monthly frequency to allow for more observations and better identification of the regimes. This exercise is meant to show that the relationships we established in our main analysis are not an artifact of the quanta regression, but the genuine feature of the data that also alternative nonlinear models would identify. So when comparing realized average inflation over the next year in black against the estimated regime probabilities, I hope it becomes clear to you that the estimated regimes broadly correspond to states where inflation is low, moderate, or high. And here you can now see uh, the regime-specific fitted values along with the estimated quantas from our quanta regression model, which as you can see are remarkably similar. In particular, the low inflation regime corresponds to the 10th quantile, the moderate inflation regime to the median, and the high inflation regime to the 90th quantile. And for those of you who are interested, this result that the Markov switching uh, regression and the quanta regression when put on equal footing deliver the same predictive densities is carefully studied and described in my recent work with Dario, Danilo and Pablo that I mentioned before. So you can read more about this there. All right, so in the paper, we also compare the United States experience with that of the Euro area. And there are some notable differences across the Euro area and the United States in how the determinants considered in our model affect the inflation outlook. For instance, in the Euro area, inflation inertia, the unemployment gap, and to a small degree also relative prices still play a role in shaping the inflation outlook. And when it comes to the credit spread, it still creates a downside risk to the inflation outlook, but it does so in a symmetric way. And this can be seen in this figure, 
where we show the densities of one year ahead inflation in the euro area using core HICP inflation and in the United States for the periods at the onset of the Great Recession, that is 2007-Q4 and 2008-Q4. So these would be the blue densities in the left and right columns, respectively. The black densities capture the partial effect of an experiment in which the credit spread is set to zero. And as you can see, while in the euro area, the distribution experiences a symmetric location shift to the right in the counterfactual experiment, the U.S. distribution is not only pushed to a higher inflation value, but also exhibits way smaller tail risks. All right, so risks to the inflation outlook have been front and center at the peak and in the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis and still are nowadays. So we show how our model augmented by credit spreads allows to identify important changes in the United States inflation distribution during this historical episode. And in doing this, we consider a monthly version of our model to allow for a more real-time assessment of inflation risks. The model is estimated from January 2000 to April 2020, using as dependent variable one year ahead inflation up to April 2021. The chart shows results for average inflation over the next 12 months with core PC inflation on the left and core CPI inflation on the right. Specifically, it shows the distributions since January 2020 with markers given at the median and at the 90th quantile. Now, both core PC and core CPI inflation distributions, as you can see, have shifted to the right since the beginning of this year. And indeed, the selected months show the quick buildup of downside risk to inflation during the harsh initial months of the global pandemic, January to May 2020 in the top panel, which were then followed by the increase in upside risk to inflation in most recent months in the bottom panels. All right, as a final exercise, we now ask what would have been the predictive distributions over the next 12 months had the financial conditions deterioration of March 2020 persisted in May 2021. The chart presents distributions again of average inflation over the next 12 months, but now is of May 2021 for our baseline in the blue solid lines and in this quote unquote counterfactual scenario in which credit conditions are those prevailing as of March 2020 in the black dashed lines. Now the easing of financial conditions since the onset of the pandemic has moved the distributions of both core PC and core CPI inflation rates to the right, reducing downside risks of low inflation. And indeed, had the financial conditions not eased during the period from their March 2020 state, the probability of inflation running at or above 2.5% would be about 7 percentage points lower for both core PC and core CPI inflation rates as of May 2021. To summarize, in this paper, we show that one needs to look beyond the conditional mean to fully understand inflation dynamics. And indeed, we find ample viability in the tail risk to inflation, even when focusing on the post-2000 period of stable and low mean inflation. Most importantly, we show that financial conditions carry substantial and persistent downside risk to inflation. Finally, our results, we hope, provide empirical guidance and suggest more efforts in modeling the linkages between the entire inflation distribution and financial markets in the context of nonlinear models. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, we will now turn to Paolo. Um, so please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A and then we'll get to those in the, in the chat and we'll get to those at the end for Q&A. Uh, moving on to Paolo, uh, looks like I can see your slides and I can see you and I can hear you. So you're all set, please take it away. You have 20 to 22 minutes. Thank you, thank you Ed and thanks uh, to all the organizers uh, for including this paper in the talk. This is joint work with uh, Guido Ascari and Cassie Ake. So the question of uh, the paper is whether uh, the long run Phillips curve is vertical or not. Uh, this issue was uh, highly debated uh, in the past, in the 60s. And back then, uh, uh, Phelps and Friedman proposed the natural rate hypothesis, saying that uh, in the long run, the Phillips curve is vertical at the natural level of output or at the natural rate of unemployment. So this idea played a cornerstone role in macroeconomics, both in theory and in practice. 
I think we can fairly say that uh, uh, this is one of the working assumptions that central banks use when they uh, implement uh, monetary policy. Now, given the importance of, uh, uh, of this uh, concept, uh, if you look at the literature, it is surprising to note that uh, uh, empirically, there is not so much work devoted to uh, understanding empirical validity uh, of this uh, idea. And from a theoretical point of view, uh, if you consider modern ma macroeconomic sticky price models, in general, they do not imply the absence of a long-run relation between inflation and output. In particular, if you take the new Keynesian model and you uh, assume that the steady state of inflation is not zero, as in the original simple version, but it is a positive number, then you'll find that the higher is this number, the lower will be uh, the GDP in equilibrium. Uh, these are now called generalized new Keynesian models. Uh, uh, Guido and Archias Bordone have a paper on the Journal of, of Economic Literature in which they give a very comprehensive uh, treatment of this topic. Now, the question of this paper is empirical. We ask, what is the long-run relation between inflation and output? And the paper is divided into two parts. In the first part, we answer the question using a time series model. We find that uh, in the long run, the Phillips curve is not vertical, but is negatively sloped, meaning that higher inflation is related to lower output in the long run. And what is key to get this result is to model the long run Phillips curve as nonlinear. And here we also have a methodological contribution. We propose, let's say, a convenient way to model uh, nonlinearity. So what we find in, the, in this first part, I, I, I would say is a mere statistical uh, uh, relation between the two uh, unobserved values that are potential output and trend inflation. But we cannot really say anything about causality. So in the second part of the paper, we interpret uh, our findings through the lens of a structural model, and we choose exactly the generalized New Keynesian model that I was mentioning before. In this model, the causality goes from inflation to GDP. So it's higher trend inflation that causes lower GDP in the long run. And uh, the reason why we choose this model is that it has the two key features that we find uh, in the statistical analysis that are the nonlinear and the negatively sloped long-run Phillips curve. So we estimate the model and we show that the model is also able to capture the quantitative features of the time series analysis when it comes to measuring the uh, cost related to trend inflation. Okay, so this is the overview uh, of the paper with the results. Let me now describe uh, the time series approach that we use. So I like to call it a time-varying equilibrium VR because it is a generalization of the steady state VR by Matthias Villani, 2009. So consider uh, uh, here this equation, xt is the vector with the observed variables at time t, and we call x bar t the vector with the long-run values of xt. Now the deviation of x bar from the long run is, uh, uh, so these deviations are modeled together uh, with the VR with stochastic volatility. Now, we are not the first to use this framework. Uh, uh, Del Negro, Giannone, Giannoni, and Tambalotti used it. Uh, uh, recently, Johannes and Mertens, and there are also other papers around uh, that are using the same framework. This is a, a trend cycle decomposition in which the vector of observable xt is decomposed in the, into a long run component, x bar, and a short run component, x alpha. So, the short run component is described by this VAR, and uh, this VAR is stable uh, and has unconditional expectation equal to zero, so that uh, the, the gap component here is expected to converge to zero. And this is why we interpret the bar component as the long run. And for the bar component, we uh, we use the hypothesis that uh, uh, the x bar are a function of a vector uh, theta t, uh, it is a latent vector, and this is a Markov process with stochastic uh, uh, dynamics. Now, these two functions, h and f, uh, are in general that can be nonlinear. They will be nonlinear in our case. So, in particular, what we do, we have a model for three observables GDP per capita, inflation, and the nominal interest rate. For the short run component, the VR has four legs. And for the long run, so we have three elements in our X bar vector output. So we have potential output in X bar, inflation, we have trend inflation in X bar, and the long run nominal interest rate. 
So for potential output, we assume that this is the sum of two components, a trend and a function of trend inflation. Let's first concentrate on the trend. So this trend is quite standard, uh, and many people are recognizing it because it has been used quite extensively since a long time. So this trend has two shocks. If you have a shock, eta yt, uh, that changes the level of the trend, and a shock uh, to the growth rate of the trend, that is a random move. This function delta is what we add on top of what is uh, standard, uh, say. And in particular, the assumption here is that uh, uh, when trend inflation is equal to zero, also this cost, this, this function is equal to zero. In this way, we can interpret uh, this trend, uh, y star t, as the counterfactual level of potential output uh, under zero trend inflation. Then we assume that trend inflation is a random wall, and for the nominal interest rate, we assume that uh, that the long run Fisher equation holds. So this is equal to trend inflation plus uh, a measure of the real interest rate in the long run. And here with Borrow from Labak and Williams, we assume that this is a function of the growth rate of potential output plus a Z that, uh, that is a random work that should capture all the slow moving trends that are not directly modeled in, uh, in, this, uh, in this form. Now, the first equation here is our long run Phillips curve. What is delta? Our choice of delta, the function delta, is a piecewise linear function. So we assume that delta is going to be equal to a slope k1 times trend inflation when trend inflation is below a certain threshold tau, but we allow for that slope to change and we add a constant when trend inflation uh, is above that threshold tau. Why this choice? First of all, and the most important aspect is that uh, this model is very simple to treat. And here we have our methodological contribution that I will explain in the next line. In general, we think that this model can approximate the kind of nonlinearity we have in mind, and it's quite easy to interpret. Let me explain the methodological contribution. The model that I just described can be written in this state space form. Yt here is a vector of uh, observed variables, and theta t is our latent process. D, F, M, G, and P are matrices, but these matrices are functions of the vector of latent process theta t. In particular, they are function of one element of theta t, which is trend inflation. We assume, in fact, that these matrices might belong to two groups, group one and group two, depending if trend inflation is below the threshold or above the threshold. Our methodological contribution is that we can find the likelihood function and the posterior distribution of theta t analytically. Now we think that in general this is nice because this model represents a good compromise between efficiency and misspecification. As econometrician, uh, I always uh, find it desirable to, uh, to estimate, to specify the model as nonlinear because I want to, if I think that uh, there are important nonlinearities, I would like to uh, reduce the misspecification of the model. However, for nonlinear models, in general, uh, the likelihood function is not available analytically. So uh, I need to approximate it, and the question is how good is the approximation? If the approximation is not very good, the efficiency of the filter in a statistical sense is very low. On the other side of the spectrum, there are linear models that are very efficient because the likelihood function is available analytically. However, uh, the risk is that we are missing important nonlinearities, so the model is misspecified. The piecewise linear model is a compromise because we are capturing some of the nonlinearity, but at the same time, since we have uh, the analytical uh, uh, form of the likelihood, in terms of efficiency, this model, the, this, the estimator that we have is very comparable to the one we would get uh, with the linear model. So we think that in our, in our case, this is a very good choice. This is not always the best choice. There is a cost with respect to the linear model. And you can see it from equation four. The piecewise linear specification requires the estimation of a higher number of parameters, including the threshold tau. So going a bit more into the specific, uh, our sample is, so we use US data uh, from 1960 Q1 to 2008 Q2, use a Bayesian approach. So remember, there are two sources on nonlinearity. We have stochastic volatility, 
and we have a piecewise linear long gap strip score. So we find it convenient to estimate it uh, to uh, particle filters. There are two aspects that I want to stress. The first is that thanks to the analytical results on the piecewise linear model, we can improve the efficiency of the filter through the so-called Rao Blackwellization. So we use the Rao Blackwell theorem. And the second aspect is that we use the particle filter also to approximate the posterior distribution of the parameters. In particular, we use, uh, we combine two techniques, the particle learning by Carvalho, Johannes, Lopez, and Paulson, and uh, the uh, mixture of normal distributions uh, uh, as in the West in 2001. Okay, let me show you the results. The first thing that we do, we estimate the model under the assumption that the long run Phillips curve is linear. So we only have one slope, that is kappa. And here you see the posterior and the prior distribution. When we specify a linear long run Phillips curve, we estimate, we estimate the slope equal to zero, as you can see. When we instead, we estimate the nonlinear version, the piecewise linear version, so we have two slopes. Again, here I'm uh, com comparing the prior in blue and the posterior distribution of the two parameters. When trend inflation is below the threshold tau, then the slope is zero. But when inflation is above the threshold, the estimated slope is negative. Uh, it is important to stress that the linear model is a particular case of the piecewise linear, but it's rejected by the data because the data, when you give the opportunity to the data, to the model to, to, to have a non-linearity, then, then the model wants the non-linearity and uh, estimates the, the second slope uh, in the negative territory. So this is instead the, the estimated threshold, tau. Uh, so the slope changes when uh, trend inflation becomes above uh, uh, 4, 4 basically a bit more than 4%. When we combine this information together, then we get uh, our estimated long run Phillips curve. Here you see on the x axis values for trend inflation, and on the y axis, uh, the difference between the potential output and the counterfactual potential output under zero trend inflation. So these are the costs from trend inflation. You can see that the estimated uh, costs are basically zero until we get to the threshold of 4%. After that threshold, this relation becomes uh, nonlinear. So this is an estimate of, uh, of trend inflation plotted together with inflation. And if you combine the information in this chart with the long run Phillips curve of this chart, then we can get uh, what we call the long run output gap. This is the cost of trend inflation estimated over time. So here on the x-axis you have time, and here you have the distribution of, again, the difference between potential output and the counterfactual potential output under zero trend inflation over time. So before the 70s and uh, during the great moderation when trend inflation was was below the, 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 the threshold, then these costs are estimated to be equal to zero. While during the great inflation period, the median cost is roughly is, is around 3%. So potential output during the great inflation period is estimated to be 3% lower uh, with respect to the case of, uh, of zero trend inflation. So the point here is that the costs from trend inflation are quite substantial. Now, we want to understand if, uh, uh, if we can interpret the findings of, in this model through the lens of uh, uh, the generalized New Keynesian model. So we consider a generalized New Keynesian model with three equations, an intertemporal Euler equation with external habit and consumption. We have a generalized New Keynesian Phillips group and a tailored type monetary policy rule. Importantly, we, have, uh, we allow for time variation in trend inflation, uh, and this gives us uh, to the mechanism of the model, a nonlinear and negatively sloped uh, long run Phillips group. Another important assumption is that when taking decisions, the agent considers trend inflation as a constant parameter. So we are under what is called the anticipated utility model by Krebs. And here we're following the uh, Corbyn's Bordeaux in 2008. Finally, we put stochastic volatility into the four shocks we have, the discount factor, technology, monetary policy, and uh, uh, trend inflation. Now, before uh, showing you the results, I just want to, to stress what, what is the mechanism behind the model. So why do we have uh, a long run Phillips curve which is negatively slow? In, in the New Keynesian model, the friction is price steepening. So the, the assumption, we have 
we have calvo pricing. So the assumption here is that uh, firms have a positive probability of not changing the price or changing the price uh, at time t. So this uh, uh, creates price dispersion, uh, which leads to an inefficiency in the quantity produced. Now, the, the idea is the following, the intuition. If there is high trend inflation, the higher is the trend inflation, uh, the higher will be the price dispersion because the firms, when they get the opportunity to change the price, they will take into account that the cost uh, uh, may be quite high. So they have the, the, the incentive to uh, increase the price even more when they get the opportunity to change. And this increases price dispersion even more, increasing the inefficiency in output. Formally, you can see that considering the uh, aggregate employment, and the definition of aggregate employment is just the integral of the employment of uh, the firm or over the firm's I. If you substitute in uh, first the production function of the firm and then the demand for the good I that the firms face, uh, then you get this equation. And the, the, this integral here is what we call price dispersion because this gives you uh, a this gives you a measure of uh, how price, single prices differ from the general level of prices. You can write all of this, uh, making uh, the output y explicit, and then you get something that uh, looks very familiar. So you say that output de depends on uh, technology and on employment in the usual fashion, but now uh, it, you see that it also depends negatively on price dispersion. And very importantly, price dispersion in the long run is a positive function, nonlinear function of trend inflation, for the reasons I tried to explain before. So we estimate the generalized Keynesian model, and then we can compare uh, what are the costs that this model implies and compare it with what we found from in the statistical analysis. In this graph, you, you see the same picture that I showed you before. So it's the long run Phillips curve. Uh, from uh, the time series model in blue compared with the long run Phillips curve uh, implied by uh, the estimated generalized Keynesian model in black. And as you can see, uh, the, the costs um, implied by this model are very much in line with what we find uh, from the statistical analysis. So I can conclude saying that, uh, okay, so the, the question of the paper is what is the longer relation between inflation and output? So we use a time series model, and the time series model suggests that the longer run Phillips curve is nonlinear and negatively slow. We then interpret these findings through the lens of a generalized Keynesian model, and we find that this model is able to measure the cost implied by the longer run Phillips curve in a very consistent way with uh, the time series model. And thank you for staying on time. All right, so at this thank point, you. we have some time for questions. Um, so I see we have one from Christian in the chat for Francesca. Uh, so uh, maybe we can answer that one first. So Francesca, this one's to you. The credit channel can explain downside risk to inflation. Uh, what about upside risk? What kinds of variables would you use to proxy supply bottlenecks or other types of supply side shocks? Of course, this is extremely relevant for our present day circumstances and I think on many people's minds. So uh, we'd be happy to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, as you anticipated, Christian hit the nail on its head with uh, this question. Um, so as you can see in the results that I've presented you, the model in its current um, uh, setting already has the ability to uh, capture some of those upside risks that we have seen in recent months. However, if I had to make this model uh, fully operation, operational for policy purposes, I would indeed have to think about supply bottlenecks and also pent-up demand. Uh, thinking about pent-up demand, I would probably need to think about some measures of disposable income that would better correlate with inflation than, say, the unemployment gap in current times. As to supply bottlenecks, you know, any variables relating to shipping costs or the cost of used goods on top of the measure of import and oil prices that is already uh, considered in, uh, in the model would, uh, you know, would more appropriately uh, describe the inflation process as well. But at the end of the day, I think that, you know, uh, including these variables probably won't be enough to 
make the model fully operational for you know this current times and probably what is needed is also to look at um, this model in a panel dimension that also considers some sectoral measures of inflation rates and also you know different uh, inflation components and separation of each other since as we know the pandemic has had very asymmetric effects across uh, you know, different uh, sectors of the economy, uh, notably services versus manufacturing, and also across um, inflation components, some of which, as we know, uh, now more prominently feature in their pass through uh, to realized inflation. All right, thank you. Um, maybe we'll move to Ali's next. Is there any empirical, this is for Paolo, is there any empirical reason to think causation runs from inflation to output? In principle, low output can worsen budget balances and increase the incentives of policymakers, uh, if I've lost the question, to raise inflation to finance those deficits, leading to a negative steady state correlation with opposite causation. How can we distinguish between these two? Please, Paolo. Yeah, so uh, it, it's perfectly possible, I think. And uh, the, so the st our starting point is the time series model doesn't give it doesn't give any answer in, in that. So what we do, we uh, interpret this finding uh, with, uh, with the generalized Newkinson model with that causation, but uh, we can't really say if uh, the causation, I mean, the story that, uh, that uh, Oli has in mind is perfectly, is perfectly fine. Um, so it's important to stress that uh, the point of the second part of the paper is just to say that uh, the workers model under, under cargo pricing, well, it does a good job in, uh, uh, in measuring the cost from trend inflation, but we can't really say, you know, uh, written in stone that the causation is that one. We're just saying that it is a good model uh, when it comes to, uh, to measuring those costs. But uh, yeah, I think uh, he has a point. So the answer is no, we can't say the, uh, for sure that the causation is that one. Thanks, Paolo. So Andrea Tambalati had a question for each of you. So Andrea, I will... Uh send a request to unmute you and you can uh, ask your questions at the same time if you wouldn't mind. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so Francesca, I was curious to know if you guys looked at the connection between financial conditions and inflation, say three years down the road, uh, as opposed to sort of more contemporaneously the way the way you're doing it. And, and you know, does the sign flip there? I'm thinking of the work that uh, David has uh, with uh, Stein and uh, Egon, I think, about, uh, again, sort of compressed spreads, uh, sort of leading to problems, say, three years down the road. Um, and then the question for, um, for Paolo is very interesting paper. What, is it possible that what you guys are picking up, which, I mean, again, is, is probably there in the data is essentially the fact that over those 15 or so years in the 70s when inflation was high output was low and this goes a little bit to all his question you know maybe it's a little bit hard to say what the channels through which that correlation uh you know does it go from up to inflation or the other way around is is, is probably a little bit hard to, to to tell so i mean i think it's a reasonable way of characterizing the data but is there more that your model gives you than just that simple sort of long run correlation thank you so much thank you all right i'm gonna so, so start to good thank you go ahead yeah. uh thank you for uh, your question there so actually, no, we have not looked at that. Uh, I can see where that question is coming from. I was already a bit um, skeptical or um, yeah, skeptical in using our model uh, to explain such you know long horizon movements um, in inflation uh, because you know we have both a cyclical and a trend component in there, and I always thought that the three years uh, ahead would asking too much from the data in terms of the forecasting ability of credit spreads. Um, reason why when I wanted to dig uh, further into the role of inflation expectations, uh, also at horizons of three or five years in some separate work that we have done, I reverted to that model that I mentioned in my presentation of Elmar uh, Mertens, uh, where he, he looks at uh, such long horizons and rather at that more slow moving uh, trend component of inflation. Um, 
this being said, I will just take a suggestion and perhaps also look at measures of leverage that I know have good ability in uh, uh, forecasting GDP growth, uh, um, you know, at such long horizons and see whether there's something more uh, than I can say there. I, I, I can see where the question comes from. And obviously nowadays, that's a very, very relevant question. Okay, so thank you, Andrea, for, for the question. And uh, so it, it is true. So what we are capturing is exactly what you described. So uh, the great inflation period is a period in which uh, inflation is high and uh, GDP is, uh, is low. And we give the opportunity in the time series model to interpret this or as a cyclical temporary phenomenon, right? Because we have uh, the, the, the VR that describes the, the short-term dynamics, you know, it's, as rich dynamics, as four lags, and stochastic volatility, you know, or as uh, uh, something that pertains to the slow moving trend lag, right? And the model says, well, it's something that uh, is better described by uh, the slow moving part, the trend part, because uh, it's a persistent phenomenon in that part. And uh, just to clarify, you know, in the statistical model, this is exactly a, a correlation. So when you look at the, the, the Phillips curve there, you know, the, the slow parameters appear in the correlation matrix. So it, it is a correlation. So we can't really say, uh, the, we can't deduce where the causality goes. You know? And uh, so we are very clear on that. Uh, so the causality can go both ways. So in some sense, what we find is uh, very much in, uh, in line with the traditional concept of Phillips score. What right? is a statistical relation, what we find between two unobserved variables that are trend inflation and potential output. So uh, the, if, you have, if you have in mind models that can interpret this in another way, so there is a possibility to see, as we did for the Newcastle model, if the quantitative implications are similar uh, or not. I don't know if I answered the question. Try to. Thanks, Paolo. It looks like the next two are for you, or I think maybe even the next three. So okay. uh, first one is the 4% from the statistical exercise, a possible indication we may consider a higher target. Are there other possible costs not considered a higher volatility of output, for example? Also, just is the result of your vertical Phillips curve from 0 to 4% an assumption or a result from your method? And then one from Todd that another check, is it possible to estimate the model for a couple of other economies that had less, like Germany or more? Uh, of a run-up in inflation during the Great Inflation to see if the estimated output costs change as expected given the model. Okay, yeah. Uh, so let me start then. Uh, uh, okay, so this is Miner, right? This is 4%. Uh, a higher inflation target. So, okay, the, the, the point here, so when we interpret this, the, the ca going back to the causality issue, you know, uh, the, if the causality goes from inflation to GDP, uh, then uh, we say 4% is, uh, uh, well, there is a probability distribution, so 4% is already in a, in a zone where uh, it's kind of risky to, to stay, right? You already might have substantial losses uh, uh, that are statistically relevant, right? So, but uh, we don't, you know, we don't really go into these, uh, these are more uh, uh, policy issues that we leave for the, to, to policy makers, we just you know, want to document uh, this, uh, this relation. Uh, so the 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 the, the this, this first result. So uh, replying to Agostino. So the, to the from zero to four, this is estimated. Okay. So the model wants. So when when we so the, the model estimates the first slope that is equal to zero. Okay. So it's not is a result from the estimation. We're not imposing it. We were thinking about maybe a model in which we can even impose that in the first part, but we we haven't done it. So what you see is uh, the result of an estimation. And uh, well, replying to, to Todd, well, this is a very good, uh, uh, very good uh, suggestion. Uh, I think we, sh we should probably try to, to, to do that. Uh, yes. Yes, and I think it would be also interesting to see how the costs are different because uh, uh, the cost from trend inflation might really depend also on the structure of the economy. So it's a very good uh, uh, suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. So Francesca, I had a question for you if we can shift gears for a moment. Um, so, and this relates to your direct 
approach in essence. So I, the question that I had was, to what extent are these financial conditions affecting inflation directly? And can you use your framework to assess that they're affecting inflation directly? Or to what extent are the financial conditions affecting inflation indirectly, potentially through affecting the forecast for the real economy, inflation expectations, commodity prices? So in other words, you know, can you, can you leverage some of the growth at risk literature? Because you're, you're kind of building on that. So can you use your framework and basically separate those two things? Uh, yes, so a very cheap answer uh, to your question would be that, well, you know, we have a model where we are also controlling for a measure of inflation expectations and of the unemployment gap on top of these financial conditions. Uh, but the, I, perhaps I think more appropriate answer to, to your question would be that in an ideal world, one would precisely use that methodology that I uh, developed with uh, Dario, Danilo, and Pablo, and use uh, Markov switching VAR featuring, you know, multiple variables that can interact with each other to be able to answer to that question. And in an ideal world, also, you know, identify a very exogenous structural measure of financial shocks and see how financial shocks affect the entire inflation distribution. Um, so this is just work for us down the road, and uh, you know. So your suggestion is uh, spot on, I think. Thanks. And Paolo, one more question for you in the chat there. Uh, so models featuring downward nominal wage rigidity going back to Akerlof, Dickens, and Perry also imply that the long-run Phillips curve is nonlinear, and that lower inflation implies an increase in longer-run unemployment. Would it be feasible to assess the relative importance of that mechanism? From that of relative price distortion. Um, yeah, so Manu is uh, suggesting, I think, uh, uh, another paper. It's a very interesting question, I think. Uh, I think, in general, it is possible. So if you estimate model, uh, a model like that, you can check you know, the empirical performance of this model. And, and do, but that's another, uh, this is, a, say, another, another paper. I, we, I don't think we're going into this direction in this paper. Yeah, thanks for the yeah. Th thanks for for the suggestion. Yeah. All right. Looks like we still have a few more minutes, so we'll just keep on coming. So, okay, next one for you, Paolo. Uh, so, linking back to the question um, asked that Kira asked Hassan yesterday about high inflation and attention, if high inflation would put inflation back on the radar uh, and would put more effort and change prices more often, then why would you have higher price dispersion? Thinking also of mixed evidence on higher price dispersion, higher inflation. So, how central is that to your model? And, you know, I would voice the same question, you know, you're using a Calvo framework to think about changes to the inflation steady state, you know, I think that that always raises some concerns there. So any thoughts that you had along those lines? Yeah, yeah. so no, it's, it's clear that if you have a model like that in mind, the, the, you know, the cost from a price dispersion will be lower. Uh, if you have a state dependent model, for example, right, so the, the cost will be lower. Yes, uh, uh, that, that's perfectly true. Uh, but this is not the point of, uh, so when we, when we choose that model, the question that we have in mind is really uh, about the, if the Calvo pricing, you know, is a is a good way to, not not in general, you know, but to uh, to a specific dimension, which is capturing the cost from trend inflation and empirically exposed it does. Then, uh, if uh, it does because uh, uh, maybe you know it's capturing something that is not in the model, that, that I, I don't know. In general, one might think about uh, when you, when I think about the cost from trend inflation, I think about, for example, labor market. It is not present in our in our simple model. You know, for example, that this is another uh, uh, another aspect that we should consider as well, right? So there are many aspects that we should consider, but the point of the exercise is just to say, okay, this class of models in general they do imply costs from trend inflation that are in line with to find the statistical analysis. This is the, the key message. Then if you want to enhance the model one direction and on the other, I think, you know, that's a good, uh, these are good points, but uh, you know, uh, this is not the purpose of, of our exercise. So I think, you know, we missed a, a question from Michele uh, Lenz. Uh, I'm scrolling up and down. I can answer very, uh, so Michele is asking if it could be that inflation and real activity trends uh, Share a common factor. Uh, yeah, I think it can definitely be the case, and uh, 
This is something, for example, we can uh, we can check. So we have the model, and we can put this common factor in the model and check. So we can actually uh, check for it. If this is perfectly possible. Thank you, Michele. Thank you for catching that, Paolo. Sorry about that, Michele. Yeah. All right. So with that, um, we're at eleven o'clock Eastern time, uh, which means that we will conclude this session. Um, so a big thank you to our presenters. Uh, you know, thank you for this work and thank you for presenting it at, at our conference. We really appreciate it. And thanks uh, to our audience for all of the great questions. So we have a 15 minute break for now. We will resume at 1115 Eastern time, uh, which I assume is 515 Frankfurt time with structural Phillips curves. So um, we'll take a short break. See you in a little bit. <laughs>